Kia ora and welcome to the Centre for Culture Centred Approach to Research and Evaluations Activist in Residence program. Uh, this year, as you know, our Activist in Residence program is anchored by the concept of decolonizing anti racist interventions. Central to this year's series is the active placing of peoples of color and our collective voices at the center of the struggle to dismantle racism. It is therefore a real pleasure to welcome Tiano Tuino as our activist in residence. Sure. Kiara. Tiano um, actually is of uh, Naitakoto, Napuhi, and Atriu origin. As part of his activist work at CARE, uh, Tiano has created the Solidarity Project, which I'm sure many of you have seen parts of. He has over 20 years experience as an activist, advocate, and organizer at local, national, and global levels on social justice and environmental issues. So we really have the pleasure of having an activist amidst us who connects all the way from local to the global, which has sort of been an ongoing theme for the work of care, particularly in terms of thinking through how we look at these issues globally and situate them within local context of struggles. In Pacifica communities, Tiano is known for his work in the education sector and in climate change advocacy. In Maori communities, his work is known for indigenous rights activism and again connecting the question of rights to broader questions of the environment. Central to Tiano's work is the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental questions, which uh, for many of us actually is perhaps uh, one key direction in terms of thinking about the broader questions of climate change. And this is a space within which he has worked with remote indigenous communities on the front lines of climate change and biodiversity laws. Tiana has a background in law and ha has a diverse range of experiences managing, facilitating, and working on projects, both big and small, at national, regional, and international levels that think through the thread of organizing within the context of challenging structures. He was based in Europe, where he worked with the United Nations, focusing on indigenous peoples' issues. Previous to this, he worked with NGOs that supported the aspirations of indigenous peoples in the global context around different United Nations processes. Tiano has also worked with uh, state structures with two ministries of education in New Zealand and the Solomon Islands, both times supporting curriculum and resource development in indigenous languages. Nationally, Tiano has also worked as the Maori and Pacific Education online editor for Teke Te Purangi, organizing content and working on associated projects that support Maori and Pacifica educational achievement. Particularly within the context of white nationalism, white supremacy that we have seen in Aotearoa, with the rise of white nationalism and white supremacy globally, how can Tangata Fenua, Pacifica, migrant and refugees of color build solidarity? And this is the question that Tiano has been thinking about and conversing with us on. His activist in residence, we hope, will offer us some amazing entry points to think through the questions of solidarity and panangatanga across cultures and communities. Welcome, Tiani. Kia ora, thank you. That was a, that was a, made me sound awesome. Thank you for that. <laughs> you are awesome. <laughs> so, you know, Tiana, I wanted to begin by asking you to describe your activism a little bit. Um, so I kind of see my theory of change of, uh, uh, um, as working across all the different spaces. Um, so I've worked at the UN, but I've also worked with NGOs, but also working with social movements, people's movements, that kind of thing. Because and I, because I, I think it's, it pays to be active in every single space. So if you take the UN for example, you can sit at the UN for twenty years debating an issue and have it go nowhere. So you, if that's the case, then you're best to move to move and work within an NGO or work in, a, in another particular space. Um, so I work across all of them, depending on depending on what tool is the most useful or the most useless at any particular point in time, yeah. So how do you decide what is useful or useless? Um, if you've ever been at the UN, um, sometimes you, I, I got friends of mine, right, and all they do is go to these different beige rooms and different conference rooms all around the world. It's basically, when you see their photos, it's like they could be anywhere, literally. 
And so I, I understand and respect that. And you can get things done, but sometimes things don't happen. So it's important to actually step back and stay connected to what's happening in your own communities as well. Um, so I always make sure to be an organiser um, wherever I live. So I'm Palmer Thumb, I'm um, pretty well known for organising and working with different, different folks on the ground on the different projects that we have happening in here in the city. So one of the things that seems is your ability to uh, flow across uh, spaces and be pretty fluid. Um, um, how does that work? Um, I, th I mean, I, I come from a couple of minorities, I guess. Um, my, my father migrated here from the Pacific Islands, like my great grandfather as well. Um, and so when you're a minority within a minority, you're used to negotiating with, with majority cultures. Uh, my mother is, is Māori, she's an Apuhi and my Takoto as well. So still a minority, but a larger one than where my father is from. So in terms of being able to negotiate with, negotiate or talk or build relationships with other, with other groups which may or may not have the same cultural values as you, I, I was kind of brought up with that and, and it's intrinsic for me to have that. So it makes it a lot easier, I guess, for me to sort of move across different groups because I'm used to being a minority within a particular space and trying to understand what these particular, what the, you know, the particular cultural underpinnings and values of these different groups as well. So moving across, used to it, been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things you said within this context is um, how even within this movement, it is really important to think through um, what are your commitments to the local and in organizing the local. Why is that so? Um, my grandfather, when he moved over, this is something I learned from my grandfather. He was an old school trade unionist, so he was really big about the he was really big about the trade unions and being with the people and being committed to the community, and that is something that I have learned as a truth for myself. So no matter where I live, I always try to try to organise. So for example, uh, last year we had the Weapons Expo come here into Palmerston North, so I was one of the organisers with Peace Action Manawatu to organise and to support peace activists from around the country to come in and to oppose the Weapons Expo. I saw that as part of uh, my civic duty and also something that I learned from my community. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that Peace Action Manawatu example is an excellent example because it brought so many different parts of um, the local uh, yeah. together. So what are some of the key principles of organizing that you bring to uh, the conversation when you're, say, organizing around an event or an issue? Um, I, I um, probably understanding that there is always going to be a diversity of opinion and a diversity of comfort level. Um, and so like the groups that came ac from across the country were very, very diverse. And you know, Palmerston North compared to Wellington is actually quite socially conservative. So it was important for us in that case to do some outreach events. So we had like events at the Globe, um, you know, film showings and all this kind of thing. We had a, a week of peace and different events just to sort of open up to the community to say, hey look, these are the particular issues when you bring companies like Lockheed Martin into this town. Um, this is what we are. This is what we are organising to do. So to build up that build up that awareness is always really really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you have the groups together, it's all about kind of trying to suss out. Uh, you know, people are here to be activists and to be be peace activists, but to organise uh, the the maximum use of everybody's time. So sometimes uh, people are really comfortable with uh, nonviolent direct action (NVDA) we call it. And some people just want to do symbolic waving signs and that kind of thing. So it's about creating space so that everybody can do what they want to do, but without tripping over each other. Um, not easy to do, to mm. be honest. It sounds easy in theory, but it's a, a process of talanoa, kōrero, and negotiation within all the different groups so that people can create spaces for them to all do what they are here to do. Mm, because there are very different kinds of comfort levels, probably when you bring different kinds of stakeholders into the process. Yeah, yeah, like even, so we had some folks from the Catholic Workers come up as well, and they have a long, long um, tradition of peace action as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, they've got their thing happening, and then you have some of the young peace activists coming in from, from Wellington and Auckland, and they've got their different way of doing things as well. We live here in Palmerston North, and so we understand what this community is and what the comfort levels of people to organise things. So having that kind of um, underpinning some of the things of what's possible um, is also an important ingredient into the mix. Yeah. Mm. 
you know, one of the things um, when, um, you know, I was sort of preparing for this conversation that struck me is your engagement with politics and with the realm of the political. So how do you see the relationship between activism and politics? Um, I see, I mean, I see them as intrinsically linked. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways you can't differentiate between, between the two. Um, if you talk about parliamentary politics, well then the agitation on the outside creates the momentum to put pressure on the parliament to move in the direction that you want it to do. So there's definitely that, uh, that link as well. Um, there is a history of activists entering into parliament as well, so there's, there's that tradition. But then, and then sometimes uh, I have a lot of activist friends whose primary work is to build up those social movements outside of the parliamentary political system. Very real part of what I would say of the, a real, real part of the, an important part of the political realm here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So how actually within the context of Aotearoa, the social movement process works uh, in creating political change? Um, I think you've got to build on the struggles of the past. Um, and so uh, I, I think we, uh, we do have an issue of trying to remember of what happened before. And so you have like new generations of activists come up and they, and they may not know what had happened on the past. And actually, kind of, uh, I think activists are generally pretty terrible about passing down activist knowledge from one generation to the, the next, intergenerational transmission of activist knowledge from, down, down, um, from one generation to the next is, does not happen in a very systematic way. Um, but it does happen. Um, it, it does happen in small ways, in small organic ways. It's just not as planned as, as well planned as it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you give an example? Um, I can give a good example. Um, I think what's happening up in Ihumato uh, and the success of the mobilization of all the different community is built on the foundation of good groundwork. Um, they've connected and built up this, uh, these relationships with different groups over the years, but they've also learnt from past and previous land occupations as well. Um, we, know, we know that with uh, every single Māori land occupation that I've been on, and I've been on more than most people, um, there is always there is always different points of view within the mana whenua, and there is usually always a group. Um, when I say usually, always, I mean always, always. In my experience, one group that wants the protesters or the occupiers or the protectors to move off the land. You know, they've cut a deal with the government or the developers or whatever. That happens. It's normal. And then you have the other group, which is, you know, standing up for the land, exercising their rangatiratanga, maintaining ahika looking after the whenua, wanting it to wanting it to come back to the to the hapu, the iwi or the whānau as well. That always happens as well. And so I think that idea has been learnt. And so it was not it was not surprising for many people that are activists that that that, that division was actually there. And so for me it's about recognizing well actually if they are if you're gonna look at a look at a particular mana whenua group and you uh, what I do is which group is exercising mana whenua, uh, exercising Langatiratanga? which group is looking after the whenua, which group is uh, building community. And if you look up the example of Ihumata, they had gardens, they had holiday programs, they had parakore zero waste in there. You know, they've been working on this stuff for, for years. I, I was just there last week, you know, they had some kind of uh, veggie boxes there with these big ass cabbages and stuff like that. So, you know, you can see there's physical evidence that they have been nurturing the whenua. So for me, it's like, well, I will immediately align my support with that, that mm. faction of the mana whenua. Mm. You know, this is fascinating because it also points to something that is deeply colonial. Uh, because within the context of the mana whenua, there's this contradiction or this tension, as one might say, that exists. And you say it's almost always, uh, would seem like is a product of the colonial process itself in a way that the colonizer thrives on seeding and reproducing that tension. Uh, do you see it that way? Yeah, I definitely see it that way. Um, I mean, like you talk to most people, you know, on every side of the treaty settlement process, and they'll tell you that it's, it's the, the, it is designed to give the best outcome as, for, as possible for the crown. It's, it's about kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that comes out quite a lot. And I think it's really important to actually look at the treaty settlement process from in the context of neoliberalism. Maori people are not immune to it. We are also that is also 
part of our reality as well. It's a part of colonization just as much as it's part of neo-colonization, neo which is in many ways you can draw the parallels between that and neo neoliberalism. Um, and so the treaty settlement process fits in nicely and neatly within the framework and the paradigm of neoliberalism. And so in the same way that uh, benefits don't trickle down, they trickle down to folks in any other um, neoliberal paradigm, it is often the same thing, if not always the same thing within the treaty settlement process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in that sense, I guess what you're pointing to is that the, the very idea that neoliberal ideology thrives on inequality and producing and catalyzing inequality, that then also gets reproduced within the treaty settlement processes? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, it's, and, but, but to be fair to everybody that is involved mm. to the, in the treaty settlement process, it's the only game in town. Mm. Um, and I know many Māori know this. It's like, well, this is, what, this is, this is the game in town and we have, to, we have to play it. I mean, like the fundamentals of it is very problematic. So um, you don't, like if you look at things like the uh, United Nations Declaration on, on, the, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, you know, these rights are inalienable. You can't settle them. You know, so the whole, even the name itself, the fundamentals of it is very, in my mind, very problematic. You can't settle treaties. Treaties are relationships. They are things that keep going on. But of course, the whole idea of a settlement fits nicely within the neoliberal paradigm. Um, so I couldn't, like, for example, take the right to, you know, the right to freedom of expression, put it in a bottle and sell it on trade me for five bucks. Yet we do that with the treaty settlement process. We say, well, your, your inalienable right to this particular piece of land, we're going to settle that and sell it. You know, here's your money, see you later. Um, that, in my mind, runs counter to um, all international norms as it, uh, as it pertains to Indigenous people's rights. What a powerful point. So in that sense, do you see social movements like Ihumata having a role, uh, not just in working within uh, the boundaries of what's defined as the settlement process, but yeah. actually disrupting the very meaning structure of the settlement process. I hope so. I think so. And um, people have said that, uh, um, ha that. Other commentators have said that because, well, if you, if this, if we start talking about private, private land, well, then that'll undermine the, in the entire treaty settlement process. Well, if it does that, so be it. Mm. Mm. I want to. Uh, shift a little bit to your work within the context of labor because yep. you've also worked quite a bit within the labor organizing space. So do you want to first talk a little bit about what you have done? Um, I, I, I think it's, I mean, I haven't worked for any trade unions and stuff like that, but I've got friends pretty much in all the different trade unions. I, I think it's really important to always have a class analysis across all of, all our stuff and particular in, particular in um, indigenous people's struggles as well. Um, often it's like uh, the Tiro Ranga Tiro Tanga struggle is this, and we have no classes in the Maori society, which I don't agree with. I think um, we are as much a part of this society and are colonised by it as much as anybody else. And the class con contradictions that we have in have in Aotearoa New Zealand is, are also filtering in, into into Maori society. Um, and so I think it's important to always have that have that analysis so that we know and can see where power shifts and why it shifts and why, uh, and if it is unjust, why we should challenge it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can you, can you? I'm thinking of an example. Yeah. I will go back 20 years, there's surely something there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's, there's, a long, there's, there's always a long history of trade union support with, mm. um, with Māori land occupations. They are always there. They were there at Bastion Point, they're up at, up at the Ihu Mātau. Um, I mean, I saw some, some of the first union organisers up at Ihu Mātau as well. So I think there is definitely, there's definitely this whole notion of working class solidarity. I think it, you know, it, it, could, it could be stronger. Um, you know, when we look back at the 80s and how the whole, whole trade union movement was undermined by the privatisation of the, of the 1980s, that also impacted on impacted on on Māori society as well and if you reflect back on the history of of, of the Tenoranga Tiritanga movement many of the people that were organized were also trade union tra trained as well you know, people like Sid Jackson who's a trade unionist um, Ken Mira from Parkeye Tore was a trade unionist and they would take those skills 
and then use them to help our people. And I've said that to a lot of my um, friends within, Māori friends within uh, the trade union movement. It's like those skills that you learn in the trade union movement are very useful for our people. You know, you might not have flash Māori and all that kind of carry on, but you could take those skills and use them for our people. You know, those are valuable skills. Being able to actually organise people is is a, is a skill that our people need. And it's trade the trade unions is one of the only places you can get that skill. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, one of the things you have talked quite a bit about is this idea of solidarity. Yeah. Um, and so in thinking through trade unions, what do you think are the anchor points for solidarity with, say, an indigenous rights movement? I think it's um, it's the recognition of our common our common good. Common good is probably a better word. The the different like uh, the, the way the way that I see the landscape is uh, if we look at colonization and the formation of the nation state, um, and we want to consider this from a Maori worldview. That often, well, for me, it does. It, it butts up against this whole notion of the nation state. So, if we, so often when I talk to like uh, Maori whānau, I say they say, "Oh, well, I'm taking a Maori view on this." I go, "Okay, really? So, what do you mean by a Maori worldview? Where's that geographically? Is it just the North Island and the South Island?" And then, of course, it isn't, because if you look at the uh, the whakapapa of our people, it actually stretches out beyond the borders of the North Island and the South Island. And there's a beautiful marae up at Auckland University, Waipapa Marae to all the different tūpuna of all the different waka and all this kind of thing. One of the things that strikes me about that whare is none of those people were born in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They were all born in the islands, which says to me that the Māori worldview is actually not contained within the nation-state of New Zealand. So when we're building solidarity with other people, it's being mindful that our solidarity and our worldview should not be contained within the constraints of the New Zealand state. And for me, that liberates us to actually understand that if we are going to look at the look at these different struggles, then we should do it from a whakapapa perspective, because we're already we're outside of the New Zealand state. If you think about that, the connections mm. between Maori here and Tahiti and Hawaii and Rapa Nui and and um, and uh, and other places, and also the whakapapa of struggle as well. So it's less about division and separation, which is actually for me the the point of the nation state, uh, and more about how we can build connections and stuff like that. So, for example, um, it was beautiful to see um, Māori communities support uh, the Muslim community down in Christchurch uh, after the terrorist attack by the white supremacists. Um, just as it was beautiful to see Muslim whānau show up at Ihu Mātau to support what was happening up in, up in Ihu Mātau and a group called Asians supporting Tino Ranga Tiratanga coming to support Ihu Mātau because we can see that um, all all of those different communities have all had to contend in some way with white supremacy. Mm. Mm. Going back to the class analysis, uh, it seems that often um, that class analysis um, can be missing in struggles of communities of color. Yep. And on the other side, it seems that in the struggles of class-based uh, movements, um, often uh, an articulation of race uh, is missing. Yeah. yeah. So how then does your concept of solidarity offer a way out of uh, that kind of ideological work of capitalism? Um, I, th I think it's, like I've worked in Australia and different places as well where it's, you talk to some Marxists and it's like, it's all about the class struggle, nothing else, you know. And for some folks, that is not their reality at all because they're living they're living in a particular place where those issues are not brought up. Um, I think we are fortunate in Aotearoa, New Zealand, because it's a small it's a small community that you do have to work across all those different kind of class and race and all these sorts of things to actually build a movement because of the size size of the place. Um, and I think that gives us a particular opportunity and as a I don't know learning example to places with larger populations where they can just sort of stay in their working class Marxist echo chamber and not have to venture out of it in the same way as when you've got larger populations. We literally can't do that here in, here in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So it's, 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 we have to be more nuanced and more particular and have deeper conversations to actually build, uh, build solidarity across class, across culture, across race, gender, sexuality, 
and all those uh, all those sorts of things. And I think um, it's a valuable thing to do. Mm -hmm. mm. So, you know, connecting this then to say uh, the Christchurch uh, terror attack. Um, you know, one of the things that seemed emergent uh, from that particular space is the amount of racism that actually exists in New Zealand, but is often invisible. Um, I would love to hear sort of your analysis of racism in New Zealand and maybe situating it within the context of the Christchurch attack. Um, we have a really, New Zealand has a, a really, a big problem with a history. You know, um, when I went through school, we didn't learn about the Treaty of Waitangi, we didn't learn about the land wars or any of that kind of stuff in any way, whatever, whatsoever. And when I talk to younger people, they touch on it, but n it's never in any deep way. And so you have this whole, whole basic set of facts, which makes it very difficult to actually have a conversation, particularly with a lot of middle class Pākehā people, about this because they don't actually have this background knowledge, um, and so on one, so that's one one massive problem. Um, or we also tend to focus on individual acts of racism, which of course those are the you know those those symptoms. Particularly when they get very dangerous, we must deal with them. But we actually have to understand the infrastructural issues as well, which is another thing that we don't deal with. We don't deal with it at the national level. So, for example, you know, like what happened with Taika Waititi with the um, it was part of the give nothing to racism. So that was fine because it was always targeted at the individual. Mm. You know, so it's all about your individual, whatever. But as soon as he came out and said, well, you know, New Zealand's racist as, whereas, and that comment pointed to the underlying racism and the institutional racism, well, then it became a problem because it wasn't targeted at the individual, it was targeted at the infrastructure and, 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 those, and, and, the, and the problems with the institutions. And that's actually where we need to get to. That's actually the underlying problem. Mm. Um, and often, you know, these people that are incredibly problematic and will make the news, including the, the, white, the white supremacist terrorist, um, they're often uneducated, working class white men. You know, they don't, have the, they don't have the necessary knowledge to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And um, one of the people I organised, um, I interviewed Gail, um, he, he put it really, really well when he said, um, you know, that white supremacy is the, is, is the antibody when, Christ, when capitalism is in crisis. You know, as it is becoming more and more so, exacerbated by the climate crisis and, of course, the biodiversity, biodiversity crisis. People start to look at people that don't look like them, and of course, here in here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where people of colour are in the minority, they look at us and they blame us for the issues that they face, whether it's job loss or whatever. Mm. So you know, this is beautiful because uh, it seems like uh, this. Um, white working class ideology aligns itself with white um, middle and upper middle and white rich people yeah. um, while actually uh, the differences and the extractive logic underlying those differences are where the problem should be focused on which then brings to a question of pedagogy so w what kinds of interventions do you build through teaching and learning that makes white working class people aware that this is what is going on? Uh, we have to deal with a history for one thing, that lack of history that has to be dealt with, um, you know, make it, either making it a core subject or whatever, so that that basics is here. Um, even when I go around talking to activist groups, I say, now they'll tell me about the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 and Russia and all this kind of carry on. Then you ask them about Rua Pekka Pekka or Pukahina Hina or Rako, you know, places that are just up the road from them, they don't have any knowledge of it. So that needs to be taken care of. Um, and I think it needs to be across every school in, in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So the, that basics of where we are and the history that we stand on is actually, you know, part and parcel of the learning, the learning process. So dealing with that, I think, is really important. Um, I think working class history is not taught very very well. I know different um, people, friends of mine, and trade unions and workers, organisations and stuff try that, but it needs to be a lot more wider spread. So like the the connections, the way that you know, like uh, trade unions have supported Bastion Point, or socialists have supported the independence movement in Samoa, or um, 
the stand of conscientious objectives and Christian socialist in World War I and how that aligned with what Te Puya Herangi was calling for up in Waikato in that particular time during World War I. Those things need to be, need to be taught. There's a massive gap of knowledge. Um, I think once we start to fill in those gaps, the conversations with, uh, uh, with working class Pākehā people become a lot easier. Mm. Yeah. To the extent, though, uh, that uh, very infrastructure of education is held in the hands of a state that is white, colonial, invested in capitalism, uh, why is the state going to be interested in doing that? That's a good question. Uh, probably not. <laughs> Um, I mean, there is space in the curriculum to do that, you know, like, uh, you know, they, I mean, but it's, it's very voluntary, you know what I'm saying? So like, there is there's a lot of resources. If you go out to Tiara, for example, the New Zealand um, history uh, website, there's a lot of, of this information there and core information there, but they don't actually have to pick it up and teach it, you know, which is why I think it would be interesting to make it a, a, core, part of, a core part of our learning so that children know the history of the country that they live in. Yeah, you know, like when I was in, when I went to school, we did this. Uh, I think six months on Canada, where we learned to draw the borders of Canada and all this. We didn't learn anything about the town I was living in, um, and we didn't even we didn't even learn that there were actually First Nations people in Canada. You know, we get this when I was growing up. Maybe it's changed a bit. The complete whitewashing of, of of history, and so we need to stop doing that, and we need to, you know, start telling the stories which were relevant to the places that we stand in. So part of you know my takeaway from this is the importance of uh, activism within the academe and the constant disruption of the um, existing bodies of knowledge in terms of what should be taught and what should be in the curriculum. Yeah, no, that I, yeah, definitely, I think that definitely would be useful. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, coming back to this idea of uh, solidarity and uh, thinking through then. Um, what do you think are the key ingredients for making a solidarity project work? Uh, empathy, I think. Um, well, definitely. I think it, empathy is definitely a, a good thing to have. Um, having an understanding of around, around what real unity means. Um, uh, so, for example, you know, um, hegemony always talks about unity, but it's the unity of sameness where you must be this way, you know, you must fit into this and this way. But unity and diversity, I think, is different. So there's two types of unity, and I believe in unity and diversity. We actually have to build that, build that solidarity between classes and gender and cultures and that kind of stuff. And it's the hard grunt work of being able to do that. It's slow, it's sitting down, meeting with people, understanding the differences and the similarities and, and that sort of thing. That stuff is slow, but it's actually more meaningful and more deep, and you can build deeper relationships with that. And you can see that emerging, emerging in, in, in Aotearoa as well. Hmm. Yeah. That seems to be a powerful antidote uh, to the global flow of whiteness and white supremacy. You know, one of the things that is so striking is the way in which uh, the rhetoric of the white supremacist in Christchurch reflected the rhetoric of the white supremacist polished politicians, whether it is in New Zealand, Australia, or the US, but now then you look at it, the same rhetoric is reproduced in the terror attacks on the US yeah. with white supremacists, be it in El Paso or be it in Dayton. So there seems real mobility to this discourse of white supremacy, yeah. to which then this idea of solidarity that you're offering can really offer a global sort of anchor, a counter narrative. Do you see it that way? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely see that way. Good ideas travel and we need to um, make sure that these ideas travel well. So like when I look at the States, I think of, um, you know, the, what, the squad, AOC, um, Elan, Omar, and, and them, and, um, you know, they seem to me to be the, at the progressive front of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of American politics, pushing back against uh, what's happened with Trumpism and that, that kind of thing. And that is an example that we could learn from. Maybe there's something they could learn from us as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to, be better organised and be more connected as well, because nothing's more powerful than people of diverse communities and cultures and genders and sexualities and all this standing up together against white supremacy. It's a powerful metaphor and it's powerful in its own 
in its own right. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, Tiana, I wanted to ask a little bit because so much of what we have talked about so far yeah. seems dialogic when things are working well yeah. and uh, sort of finding ways of transforming structures. But there are points when the structure responds to what you're doing in violent ways, yep. using tactics of fear or disciplining. Um, I wanted to hear, and I know that you have had experiences with some of this, with the raids, for instance. Yep. So I wanted to hear how you conceptualize that and how you respond to that as an activist. Um, I th I th it's understanding that there are certain narratives that always get played as well, over and over and mm. over again. Um, and they'll try to play it up at even Maltel, no doubt is that an incident happens and then hegemony and power gets to play the you know the violent protest narrative or the you know um or the or the the agitated narrative as well but it is something that is not new it is something that we have seen before time and time and again and it's about getting people to understand that this is always the way that power operates that it will try to create division between those that create solidarity and to recognize that for what it is um and uh, yeah, and it's it's really a matter of how we disseminate and pass down those types of lessons. I think is what's important. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things when I think about uh, the rhetoric of the raids yeah. is that it it operates on the production of the threatening other, yeah. right? Which, irrespective of evidence, it somehow sustains itself. And it plays out because you know even when I think about the activist in residence program, yeah. I think that you know we had Tame in here, and uh, uh, one of the uh, spaces where that pushback came from uh, was uh, this articulation that oh you're inviting now uh, terrorist onto campus. So it's a narrative that is entirely devoid of evidence, but the structure has a way of reproducing it and using it strategically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that's uh, that's abs absolutely, absolutely true. Because if you look at the evidence, um, all of the all of the terrorists, whether it's the French people that bomb the white yep. French people that bomb the Rainbow Warrior, or the white Australian guy that, you know, that um that attacked the mosque, you don't see them stopping white Australian men at the border or white French people at the border, but yet still now, uh, if you look at the, for example, the, the way that the refugee rules work that um, people from Africa or, 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 or the Africa or the Middle East are only allowed to come here as refugees if they've got family connections. Well, that's racism as well. It's racism re reproducing itself um, within the academy in this case. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the thing that is so striking is how it is devoid of evidence or yeah. empiricism. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how do we, it, it really seems like uh, like floating discourse is what I would call, right? Yeah. Those that have no substance to it. So from your activist experiences, do you have strategies in mind that can actually dismantle uh, these stories that circulate? And it seems like, you know, one can point to, look, where is the evidence? Yeah. The evidence says this, it doesn't match up. But that doesn't seem to work. It works at the moment, but the story is back up. Again, it seems yeah. resilient in that sense. I, I think um, you get to a particular point where, where uh, white civility supports white fragility, which then in turn supports white supremacy as well. And um, at, a, at a particular point in time, you just have to actually call it out for what it is and tell them what they're doing and why it's wrong. Because sometimes they'll just use all this kind of bullshit here to sort of keep continuing on the problematic behavior. Um, uh, it would be good to actually put some things in place to help them to unpack that and to sort themselves out. You know, particularly like if it's happening here in the academy as well, that's just not intellectual, you know, if I can put it that way. Um, but there is, I think there's a very strong space for uh, for white people to sort out white people. And there are there have been attempts to, to do that. So like, for example, in the treaty space, we have treaty workers and stuff like that, where they will go and talk to Pākehā people about why learning about the treaty and land wars and all that stuff is is really, really important. But then also trying to find allies, I think, is important. Hmm. There was this um, really interesting cartoon that I saw in the paper where they talk, looked at all the different peoples that have 
been labelled terrorist and always under surveillance. And you know, usually it's Maoris, of course, not surprising there, Muslims. Um, but the the cases where white people pop up are usually in a couple of places. They're usually environmentalists. Mm. So we know, like last year, Greenpeace was under surveillance from Thompson Clark, hired by MB, uh, or peace activists as well. There are another lot there that also gets routinely surveillance, and I think animal rights people as well. So for me, it's it's. I think there are potential to build solidarity with those groups of people because for some reason they tend to fit in into the same auspices of being surveil surveillance in the same way that, that they do, that we do. Um, and often when you go to these kind of like, like land occupations and demonstrations, there's usually a contingent of environmentalists or peace activists. Mm. Like there's no surprises for me anyway when Quakers show up or progressive Anglicans or Catholic workers and, and these sorts of things and you know greenies and that sort of thing because they tend to I don't know read more or be at least conscious about social justice issues and stuff mm -hmm. yeah thank you for uh, sharing so many of your experiences and so much of your wisdom drawing from these experiences as we move toward wrapping up I want to ask some questions looking at the future um, you know, we are at a juncture of the globe today where we face problems of climate change that are imminent. Uh, we face gross inequalities and we face deep racism. Um, to these kinds of problems, what does a project of solidarity offer? I reckon it offers clarity about understanding understanding the issues, like as you're saying, we've got the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and underpinning all of that is the inequality crisis. And we need to understand what that means very, very clearly, particularly within the confines of a planet which is incredibly finite. So things like you know, GDP are a completely useless way of looking at the world because it, economic growth, growth cannot continue to happen on a finite planet. So understanding that very clearly as well, and understanding that when you start to run out of run out of resources, that hegemony and, 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 and white supremacy and all those kinds of things will put people against each other. And so it's also about shining the light on, 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 on that particular way of looking at the world, but also encouraging, in the case of Aotearoa New Zealand, um, uh, white people in particular, to, to working class white people, to understand that poor brown people are not the enemy. Um, so thinking through this then, what are your hopes for the future? Um, well, I hope New Zealand reads a lot more, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> you read some of these comments on <laughs> online, it's like, oh my God, it's not coming from a place of, you know, a place of knowledge. I mean, like we have the example in, in Woodville with the, with the old guy that chopped off the, the penis off a Māori carving and he thought that was completely fine and he didn't realise that people were going to get so offended and so on and so forth. And I would think he would, he would, be an example of possibly quite a large part of New Zealand. You know, they just have no idea, no knowledge about why that could could be, and is so offensive. And so we're butting up against this willful, willful ignorance. And I think, I think hegemony supports that. They do not want these people to learn as well. So part of the project is to actually make these people learn about why that is such a problematic thing to do and to understand. Yeah. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Pleasure. Yeah.